for our next talk, we have Nafil. Um, he is a software engineer, speaker, and author. He has more than a decade of experience with software and loves about uh, talking about developer experience. Yes, and think about how to improve it. And yeah, I think you probably heard of Django or Flask or even used it. And but how did it all get started? I mean, Python is quite old. It was used very early on for web servers. So yeah, the stage is yours to so tell us all about the history of web frameworks in Python. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Does this thing work? Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So um, I have to admit, uh, this title is, is a little long. The actual title is, I procrastinated and ergo I now have a talk. Um, so I'm Nafio. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at uh, Sonar. Uh, we build code quality tools. So if you have the chance, uh, please try Sonar Lint or Sonar Cube. And you can, of course, follow me at these socials. So let's talk about how this uh, talk started, I guess. So I was having a really bad day, and um, as, as one does when, uh, when they're stuck in some bit of code, they go do something else. So I was watching my favorite episode of Chuck. And in this episode, there was this song called Once in a Lifetime. And in this song, there was this quote, you know, how do I work this? What is that large automobile? This is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful wife. And I just thought to myself, this is not my beautiful server. How did I get here? Where am I? And so... Forgive me, developers, for I have yak shaved. I went down this rabbit hole. I figured out a couple of things. I did not solve that problem. I eventually left that job. But you now have this talk. Where do we begin? We begin in 1989. Some people were bringing down walls. Other people were working on HTTP. And this is the first version of HTTP. This is HTTP 0 0.9. Um, I had to work really hard to find this example on um, a person called Tim BL's website. And uh, Tim BL, who, who you might not know is Tim Berners-Lee, uh, actually still has this website up and running, and this is pretty, pretty much the first version of HTTP that was used. It has GET, and that's about it. <laughs> In 1.0, guess what? We got headers. You need headers. You like headers. We have headers in 1.0, but uh, that was not enough. So in 1.1, we added even more headers, because you need headers. And so this is what uh, the internet mostly looks like these days. Uh, I did not create this diagram. Mozilla did. So if there's anything wrong with it, it's their fault, not mine. <laughs> so from HTTP 1.0 to 1.1, we added byte ranges. We added connection persistence. We added chunk transfers. We also added a new bunch of keywords, like options, put, delete, and trace. Um, most are which are not really used. Let's be honest. Nobody uses options, right? Actually, people use options. Okay, that guy uses options. But something is missing. We're just talking about text. What we want is dynamic content. We want to be able to tell a website something, and we want a response. We want to feel like it's human. And so in 1991, we came up with the common gateway interface, CGI, for those in the know. And... Uh, Back then, you had something called the Netscape Navigator. Ooh, look at that. Look at that big N. And, uh, and what it does is that it, uh, well, you know, you know what a browser does, hopefully. But basically, this is how the, the, uh, the whole, uh, whole shebang works. So you go, a browser sends a request to a web server. Web server sends a request to the CGI handler, which sends over environment variables to a script. In this case, I'm using Python as an example, but really most people use Perl. Don't tell anybody. And the CGI handler at the time was something called mod CGI, and you would fork for every request. And you would put in input something like this, you'd send the query string, you'd send the host, and then you'd get whatever you'd get in the standard output, you just pump that out, send it back. Some people are nodding in the audience. They've been through some pain. Um, but that's what happened. And this is what, what, would, what it would look like in a form. So you would actually put in the script name itself. And so in 1999, as parents were fighting their children because they were going bankrupt buying Pokemon cards in 1999, we came up with Zobe. This was taking over the world by storm. A lot of, at the time, there was this comic, you know, look up at the sky. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Some people think that this was a comic about Superman. It wasn't. It was about Zobe. And Zope is the framework, effectively, that allows 
because at the time you didn't have all this stuff, right? You basically wanted to publish some HTTP on the, on the web, and it was something that allowed you to publish HTTP on web servers. And, um, well, on the web. And most of these images that I have excavated from the deep bowels of the internet is from the Zope book by Amos Latier and Michel Pelletier. And you would actually have an installer for Zope. Yes, this is Windows 95. And this is what the, what the interface looked like. They even had templating languages. Like you have like, look, you have like if statements and else statements and you have vars. Isn't that amazing? You could even upload newfangled things like PDFs. And you even had connections to relational databases. Oh my God. And you could even see what was in those relational databases. And Zope is called Zope because of the Z object publishing environment. And that's because everything was an object. We took the, the Bible of object-oriented programming and swallowed it whole. Uh, everything was, a, was an object. Pages, templates, Python scripts, DTML. All of it was stored in 0DB. And that eventually became a problem. So that's why we came up with Zope 3. Um, Zope 2 was by far one of the most influential open source projects of its time, actually ever. Um, but, Zo but Zope 3 was actually the beginning of the end. And it's kind of funny because this is a Zope 3 book. If you take a look, this is the Patola Palace. And this is somewhere the Dalai Lama can't return to for reasons. And it's also, it's, it's high up in the mountains. And it's also somewhere that Zope never went back to. Because it was at one point the, the king of, of a lot of things. Uh, of, of the web in a way. Why did it happen? Well, it was an all or nothing framework. Zope did everything and, and wasn't modular. It had so many good ideas, but then people slowly had a better implementation of that idea. And so people wanted um, more control over, over what it wanted to do. It was just way ahead of its time. And there were a lot of things in Zope 3. It, it introduced a new way of working called the component architecture, but People, but it was a completely different application. It was like moving to a completely different, a completely new framework. If anybody knows about going from Perl 5 to Perl 6, it was a similar situation. And people had workarounds. They were able to take the good things in Zope 3 and kind of use them in Zope 2 and by, by a library called 5. And uh, that's why when Python 3, Python 2 moved to Python 3, your library that you used to, to handle the object migrations was called 6 because guess what? 5 was already taken. Meanwhile, we had Quixote. Anybody know who, who Quixote is? Like the, like the person? No? So this is Quixote. And, uh, and uh, this was, you know, Don Quixote was perhaps the first modern novel of our time. And Quixote, you could argue, was the first modern web framework. And this is what it looked like. You had something called Qindex. Don't, don't mind this. This is from 2000. It's old code. And this was your entry point. And what you would do is you would have something called... Um, Python templating language. So if you can see, template is a keyword, and you could refer to other templates um, inside of it, and this would be your entry point. So some people really hate on JSX. They weren't the first. We did it first. We opened Pandora's box first. Kyoti never really took off. Don't tell them I said that. But meanwhile, we had Webware for Python in 2000. Back in those days, Java was flying off like a rocket ship, okay? And they had this thing called servlets. And servlets really solved one problem, which was that for every request, you had to fork a new CGI script, and this became very slow. You did not want to do this. And so, yeah, this is what happened to your server room when you did that. And so Java, the Java community came up with something called servlets, and it would handle multiple requests at a time. You had something like... Um, Tomcat, which was the servlet container, which would be kind of sort of embedded in a web server, but not quite, and it would handle a lot more requests. And this is kind of how it looked like in Python. Okay, so you have WebKit, which is the application server, which is constantly running. You would get all your CGI environment variables because that's how it's working, right? That's how, you're, you're just passing along environment variables to your script to act on it. So you would use webkit.cgi for development, and you'd use mod.webkit on Apache for production. You'd pass this onto the web, uh, web application server called WebKit, and then it would finally get to a servlet. This is what a servlet looks like. It's not that intimidating. It's just, by the way, folks, they didn't have pep8 back then, so forget them. Um, you can see write content over here. This is a very basic Hello World program. 
And over here, you can see that if we have, you have something called actions, you can add actions to your final write content and you can refer to them. So here we have name underscore action multiply. And over here, you have multiply, which has some Python code as well as some HTML way back when. And you had templating. Um, oh, sorry, before I get to templating, you had PSPs for templating uh, as well. So it continued that tradition of having templating languages. And over, oh, oh, okay. So, and it had an ORM. How many of you use ORMs? Come on, that's, that's more, more than more people use ORMs, right? <laughs> but this was really, the first ORM in Python was called Middlekit. And you could actually declare classes like this. You could query them as well and create them. And you could also look them up like this. Oops. So you could actually look them up like this. And yes, back then we did have list comprehensions. So this is kind of how PSP looks like. You could have Python files inside HTML. You could even declare Python classes inside of HTML. And you could have good old for loops in HTML. It, it had the whole shebang. And Webware is still actively maintained. There is Webware for Python 3. Now, before I go further, I just want to clear up some terminology because now the modern stack is kind of coalescing, right? You have your web servers, which are your uh, caddies, your Nginx, and your Apaches. And you have your application servers, which is, oops. Uh, you have your application servers like Uvicorn, Genicorn, UZ, uh, UWSG, and you also have your web frameworks. So your servers are basically forwarding the request. The application servers are really in charge of forking and managing the performance of your frameworks, and your frameworks actually have your business code. So not too long later, we have WSGI, which really took the world by storm. And this is how you say it. You say WSGI, because I'm not going to say WSGI all the time. And this is kind of how it works. You have a simple application. You have a callable. You have... So it is, a, it is kind of an evolution of CGI, right? So you have to pass in your environment variables. So the first parameter is your environment. And here you have start response, which is used to create the response that you send back. And most of the time... Um, start response is provided by your WSGI server. So if you're using Geonicorn, they actually provide this for you. And this is how simple a WSGI application is. So this is your core application. You have hello over here. You have goodbye over here. It points to hello view. Hello view is over here. And all of this, if you actually just copy this code, run it with Geonicorn, it will work. That's how simple uh, it was to create a framework. And so it went bananas. WSGI really changed the way uh, Python web frameworks were made. This is John Stewart going crazy about WSGI uh, on Comedy Central. In 2002, we had Cherry Pie. And Cherry Pie was really fancy. It was, a, it was something between a compiler and application server. What does that mean? Honestly, I don't know, but this is what it looks like. Um, so you have, you have this, like, this is a hello.cpy. Okay, it's got a class, it's got this special keyword called mask, and this allows you to kind of intertwine HTTP and Python at the same time. And what CherryPy would do is it would take your CPY files and compile them to Python. CherryPy is still alive, it moves to WSGI in 2005, it does not compile things anymore, it's just a normal WSGI application, and it's not compatible with ASGI, which we'll talk about. But after 2005, it was never the same again because Python web frameworks were just went through the roof, mainly because of YouTube, not really. Um, so YouTube was released in 2005, and so was Turbo Gears. And at that time, Rails was really blowing up like crazy because they had a lot of good things going for it. They had scaffolding and tools, they had database migrations, they had an ORM, a really good one, an active record ORM, uh, active controller, uh, they had RESTful developments, and most importantly, as one of my previous uh, speakers said, docs are important, and boy, did they have good docs. And so Turbo Gears came as a response to that. Turbo Gears is the rapid web development framework you've been looking for. Sorry, mega framework that you've been looking for. And this is kind of how it worked. At the bottom, you had this ORM, which was an active record ORM. An active record ORM effectively has all the logic regarding your relation database on the object itself, which is different from a data mapper ORM, which has your objects and then uh, a data mapping layer separately. So you had your SQL object at the bottom, and this is kind of how it looked like. You could declare a person, you could query them. It, it is starting to look a little familiar to what we have today, right? 
You also had, they also used Cherry Pie for the view layer. And of course, by then, Cherry Pie was like, you know what, the CPY thing isn't working. Uh, let's just do things like uh, normal Python. You also had KID, which was a templating engine. And finally, you had Mochi Kit for Ajax. Now, I want you to read, uh, I want to read you the description about Mochi Kit. There are a lot of JavaScript libraries out there. One of the few things you'll notice about Mochi Kit is that you're not left guessing about how to use it or what's in it, or what's in there. Unlike the vast majority of JavaScript libraries, there is actual English text to describe how to use it. Tell me you're a Python developer without telling me you're a Python developer. Turbo Gears initially used Cherry Pie's server, which was built on, uh, which was 1.1 compliant, but later on moved to Whiskey. And I actually learned about Turbo Gears through uh, some O'Reilly uh, news uh, articles. And uh, back then, there was this person saying, um, we've been looking for a replacement for that sick joke of a language we call PHP. His words, not mine. And, but, but the reason they, they weren't going for Turbo Gears is because they used fast CGI, which was like this old standard, which is terrible. And the person that replied to him was a guy called David Hanemeyer Hansen. He said, what are you talking about? Fast CGI is great. We use it for everything. So DHH was doing back then what he does now. Trolling on the internet. But there was this other person. A mysterious person called Adrian H. And he was saying, my friends, you might want to check out Django. DjangoProject.com. So I looked up who this Adrian H. guy was. Turns out this is Adrian Hlavati, one of the creators of Django. Way back when. And so in 2005, we got another one. The king of modern Python web frameworks. Please give it up for Django. Django was cool, and it's still cool. I didn't say it wasn't cool. But uh, what they really brought to the table was this automatic admin interface so that you could randomly create objects using a web interface if you didn't want to use the REPL. And uh, it, it, it launched with uh, being able to use it with uh, mod Python uh, on an Apache server. So this is how you would launch it into production. And this is kind of how it looked like. You had views.py, you had urls.py, and back then, back in the good old days, actually not the good old days, the bad old days, um, you actually used regular expressions to capture the variables in your URLs. And um, back then, you had a comment section on the Django website. Um, and people complained about it. And eventually, Django added support for WSGI back in July 2006, which was pretty quick. It, it, it actually launched with uh, fast CGI and SCGI, which are, which are other ways of doing uh, gateway interfaces. But in 2005, we had another one. And this was web.py. Web web.py was actually the framework that was used to make YouTube. And it was created by Aaron Schwartz, who is no longer here with us. But he made his contribution to Python, and it, it, it was so bare bones. You, you start to see, where's my clickety? Okay, so you start to see um, the modern parts of the Python um, API for web frameworks coming to life. You have Cheetah, which is your templating language. You have db.py, which just connects to databases. And over here, what you can do is like, you can just get all the, all the tables, all the, all the information from to-dos. Um, but you would need to create the tables yourself. So it was very bare bones, but it was a micro framework. Well, not a micro frame, but a minimalist framework, so as to speak. And it was one of the earliest adopters of WSGI eventually. But initially, it started with uh, Flup. But, but we have more. There's another one, which is Pylons in 2005. Now, I'm not going to get into Pylons, but the impact that Pylons had was that it promoted a lot of good things in the Python ecosystem. You know, it was, you could use any WSGI compatible server, any templating engine, any ORM, any WSGI middleware, and you could even swap out the router and, and take in a new router. I mean, honestly, at this point in time, is, that, is it even pylons anymore? I don't know. But effectively, a lot of the things that we take for granted, which is like we can use anything with Flask or anything with Bottle or anything with Fast API, they kind of pioneered it. 2007, we had something called mod WSGI come out, and this is kind of a mod for Apache server. And this allowed you to run WSGI applications uh, via your Apache server. And honestly, this really catapulted uh, Python web framework usage in, in production. 2008, we had uWSGI, 
And UWSGI um, had uh, native support for Nginx. It was extremely powerful. It had uh, something called Emperor Mode. So you can, you can have um, UWSGI servers that are vassals of UWSGI servers. Uh, so you could kind of create your own sort of microservices, although microservices weren't really a thing back then. And in 2007, you had Web 2 Pi. Wait, what? what? All right. I don't know why this happened. But in 2007, you also had Web 2 Pi, which, you know, was like other frameworks. But what was interesting about Web 2 Pi was that it had an online editor. Fortunately, it never really gained a lot of traction, but it was an interesting thing. And many companies went on to uh, using that idea like Heroku. In 2009, we had Bottle. And Bottle was released after three days of coding, okay? And this is what Bottle looked like. Does it look familiar? In 2009, we had Tornado. And Tornado was really a renaissance of async Python web frameworks. Um, and you could plop this right after Nginx. Um, and it was kind of in response to uh, node blowing up and people wanting long-lived HTTP connections. In 2010, you had Flask. And this, this little tidbit here could fit onto Twitter's character limit, which kind, of made it uh, which kind of made it famous. So why did Flask win over Bottle? It was a good idea. Started micro, but you can end up micro. You can integrate it with anything. Great documentation. I can't emphasize the importance of documentation in getting um, adoption for your web framework. Extensibility, support and maintenance, great developer uh, development server, which would give you like really nice tracebacks as well. Um, good uh, error handling cap capabilities and only 450 lines of code. It was amazing. 2010, we had Unicorn. It was easy to use. You used Greenlets. And as a response to the blowing up of node usage, Python's Django eventually came out with Django Channels. And Django Channels is what actually led to ASGI in, in 2016. And it was really trying to make web sockets be easily usable for Python. And this is kind of how it looked like. Um, this is a WSGI app and this is an ASGI app. What the difference is scope and you use receive and send. And this is kind of an example of what a WebSocket um, request or scope looks like. We had Starlet in 2008 and I want a uh, 2018. And I want to emphasize on Starlet because this is this made ASGI usable. It was really phenomenal. Uh, and what it did. And just to give you some, uh, give you an understanding, this is how much of Starlet Fast API uses in its own code. It's practically all of it is Starlet. And in 2018, we have Fast API. And what it did is that it made um, working with authentication, uh, sorry, working with validation so much easier because it took advantage of type hints. So after going through all of this, I just realized, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So many people have worked tremendously hard. Ordinary people, ordinary members of the community built all these things. People like me and you. And uh, I wonder if we'll live up to that inheritance because Python has a very rich uh, web history. So if anything, I just want you to feel that there is an onus and a responsibility on us to continue that great tradition. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. By the way, if you ask the right questions, there are bonus slides. Ooh, bonus slides. Let's see how many we can unlock. So are there questions from the audience? I see one in the middle. Yes. And there's already a mic on its way. Thank you. So uh, you mentioned that, that there was the first online editor thing. Didn't Plon have online editor right from the start? Which one? Plon. One. Plon, but Plon came a lot later. Really? Yes. I kind so, of connect Zope and Plon at yeah, one Plon, thing. So, so what <laughs> our, our distinguished uh, friend Radomir is talking about is Plon, which is a modern day CMS, and it is kind of like a spiritual successor of Zope. And yes, it does have a, an online editor, but at that time, in 2007, Web2Pi, in my uh, knowledge, was the first, uh, first uh, framework to basically have all of it inside of the server itself. 
So it was it was kind of new. We didn't have that back then. Amazing. Thank you. All right. Are there more questions from the audience to unlock some bonus slides? There's one back there and okay, one to the left. So the one to the left first. Yeah, can we see the bonus slides, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, since you asked nicely. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Twisted Matrix was actually the first async HTTP server that came out way back when, and this is kind of what it looked like. Um, it was, it was, I didn't talk about Twisted because if I start talking about Twisted, I could, I could have an entire bunch of talks on Twisted. Uh, this is just HTTP. Twisted can do a lot of other things um, as well. Anything that's async, Twisted can do. So the question would have been, what was the first async server? Because you talked about Tornado, but there was, a, there was something before that. And the other one is kind of like the future. There is a, a new framework called Esmeralda that came out. It's a completely different uh, framework has its own kind of dependencies, its own methodology. It's really interesting. So if you get a chance, uh, take a look. All right. I think there was a question on the right. Yeah. Over there. Yeah. We kind of observed like the birth of different web frameworks. Uh, then they are gone, right? So and basically now we commonly know Django and FastAPI. Did you notice like why it happened? So you kind of mentioned like lots of benefits in the beginning when they just started. But what was the reason why they are not around? I think a big reason is, I think there are two folds, two folds. One is they didn't keep up with the, with the changing technology. Like one of the reasons Django lives on is because it adopted WSGI. It adopted these new things that were coming. It started the conversation on having long-lived HTTP requests, right? So it was on top of its game. It was constantly improving. Um, that's, that's one thing that, and, and of course it had a great community. I think one of the reasons it fails, uh, um, frameworks fail, is because you have a big leap from one framework to another. The new framework is so different from the old framework that people are like, well, if I'm going to have to rewrite all of my code anyway, might as well see what's out there. So yeah, that's, that's kind of, I hope that answers your question. Right. Are there more questions? Here's one in the middle. So we recently gained the ability uh, to run Python in the browser as well, yes. using PyScript. Do you think we'll see a web framework which tries to sort of leverage being able to run the same code server side and client side like we have with some of the JavaScript frameworks? And is anyone doing this? Well, um, we are a bunch of Python developers who don't particularly like JavaScript. So I have a pretty strong <laughs> feeling that we will figure something out on the front end. Is work being done? Yes, but I'm not at liberty to talk about it right now. All right. Are there other questions in the room? I don't see any, so yell if you have. Thank but you. I have a question about oh, change, right. uh, uh, oh. or about templating. So yes. nowadays it's all like kind of like change of templates. Yeah. When was that kind of like the standardization that one template language is enough because you showed tens of them, like different um, I just think what happened with Jinja is that it was simple enough and widely adopted enough that everybody was like, well, you can't go wrong with Jinja. I mean, so it's the IBM of, uh, yeah, it's like, it's like the big blue of Python templating languages. You know? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Some people got that. Oh, this triggers, this triggered a few oh. people to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that, that was effectively it. So you had, you had this, uh, trans transition to Django and Django like templates, but Python still has a lot of templates. You still have Mako. You still have, I think Cheetah exists in some, some regard somewhere, but yeah, it's still there. All right. <laughs> I was about to ask about Mako. How does it fit in? I know it exists, but how does it fit in into this whole picture? Which one? Where... Oh, Mako. Mako, yeah. Yeah, so Mako, I think it was created by uh, David Bear or something. Um, it, it still fits. You can still use it with Flask if you want to. You can still use it with uh, uh, Pylons, if you, uh, sorry, uh, Pyramid, which is, the, which is the successor to Pylons, if you want to. So it still exists. It still exists. Like, for example, a lot of things still exist. Like, you know, Twisted still exists today, uh, even though we have ASGI and async IO. Twisted is still fine. So if you want to use other templating languages, you can. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's finish up here and enjoy the coffee break and the show of the roboter. So Thank thanks you. a lot. <laughs>